Well, hey, church, I'm excited to be sharing session nine with you in this series of lessons entitled This Little Light of Mine, a study on disciples of Jesus, making disciples of Jesus. Hard to believe this is actually our ninth session, um, but discipleship, it, uh, it takes a lot of time to understand, to own, and to implement at the personal level and also at the church level. So thank you for hanging in there with us. If you haven't had an opportunity to view any of our previous lessons, I want to encourage you to go back and do that. They're not terribly lengthy, um, but uh, I think will be worth your time as you take the deeper dive into learning what it means to be a disciple maker. Um, if you are joining us for the first time, this may be new to you, but if you've been with us for several weeks, you'll remember that we are defining a disciple as someone who uh, daily follows Jesus, uh, is changed by Jesus, and is on mission with Jesus to save others. And that is, of course, uh, putting our hands and our heart and our head all into being disciples of Jesus Christ who are committed to making other disciples of Jesus Christ. In recent sessions, we uh, have talked about the centrality of Jesus uh, in the discipleship journey, and we noted when we first introduced uh, that uh, one of seven key elements of disciple making, um, actually I think the most important of the seven and that is Jesus, and that is that disciple makers have a heart for Jesus, and disciple makers point others to Jesus, and disciple makers trust in the promises of Jesus. In subsequent sessions, we focused on the Bible and the Holy Spirit, noting uh, respectively um, that the Bible uh, or Scripture, um, disciple makers learn from the Word of God, and disciple makers live the Word of God. Um, and then also focusing on the Holy Spirit, observing that disciple makers' fire is fueled by the Holy Spirit, and that disciple makers understand that the gift of the Holy Spirit is a gift that keeps on giving, and disciple makers trust the Holy Spirit as counselor and comforter. So if you haven't had a chance to see those lessons, then I encourage you to go back and review the scriptures that we associated with those particular uh, topics or elements of the discipleship journey. Uh, today we uh, focus on intentionality and relationality as two additional and key components of the discipleship journey. And we begin our time together today by talking about relationality or just put another way, relationships. Now I'm actually going to weave into today's lesson a little bit on intentionality, uh, and then we'll come back and talk more about that um, next time that we're together. Uh, but you'll hear those terms used um, quite frequently in tandem during our time together today. We begin as we always do in God's Word, and I want us uh, to share together John chapter 13 and verse 35, where Jesus uh, boldly proclaims to his disciples that your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. And I really um, appreciate um, Patrick and Harrington, uh, authors that we've referred to several times in this study, uh, who wrote the Disciple Makers Handbook. And they take this particular verse and use it as a launch pad into a deeper observation when they state it's not a stretch to say that the whole Bible is about relationships. The Bible speaks not just of our relationship with God, but about our relationship with other people as well. If you think about the ministry and the message of Jesus, I think it's pretty clear to see that relationships uh, with God and relationships with other people, it's really at the very heart of who uh, Jesus is, and so much so that he declared the entire scope of Scripture, basically. Um, the entire scope of Scripture rests on two foundational commands. And this is a very familiar passage to those of us who've been believers for years. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40, where Jesus, Jesus speaks, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, 
and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and all the prophets hang on these two commandments. And so as you look at that passage of Scripture, we can see at the very heart of Jesus' ministry this phenomenal declaration of the power of these two commandments that key in on our relationship with the Father and our relationship with others. I think this is probably what led um, one of our modern, very gifted authors, Francis Chan, to write, uh, Discipleship is all about living life together rather than just one structured meeting per week. And as you look at that quote, I just want to make a a handful of of observations. I I think um, this is why we see the day-to-day highly communal language in the early church, particularly in the opening chapters of the book of Acts. Um, In large worship assemblies, uh, it's easy to just watch or listen, uh, to be as passive really as we choose to be. Actually, in a lot of churches, you can slip in and slip out Uh, totally unnoticed, maybe a little harder to do these days because of COVID, Um, but it is easy to do. Uh, but, But disciples who long to make other disciples um, understand that discipleship is an action verb. Um, But, but it's not just any action verb. Um, It is an action verb that is motivated by the most powerful force on earth and and that is love Um, the authors of the disciple makers handbook note um, motives matter if you're doing all this to fulfill an inner need to accomplish something or to prove to others that you are a good leader or really smart it won't last. We don't engage others in relationship because it proves that we are effective disciple makers. True discipleship begins as a response to God's love. And I just want to emphasize that statement. True discipleship begins as a response to God's love. I think that's powerful insight. Um, and I think it's, it's just spot on that I'm not creating a, a scoreboard or a checklist or a punch list. Um, I'm, I'm just loving uh, as Jesus loved. And I think that puts me in a position as I cultivate the soil of relationships for God to do amazing things with the seeds that are planted there. In John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, Jesus said to his followers, A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And how will the world know the extent to which we are willing to love one another? Well, we'll read later in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Church, this is, this is Jesus-like love, and it's the most important aspect of authentic discipleship. And, and this is why we should read 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8, probably at least once a day. Uh, As Paul writes in this most famous of passages, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth, It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. 
you know, I was introduced to an exercise several years ago uh, where I can take this passage and since God is love, put God's name in every place where we see the word love. God is patient, God is kind, etc., etc. And I've also seen this passage personalized. Am I at a place where I can put my name in this passage? As someone who represents God's love to this earth, could this passage read, Greg is patient and Greg is kind and Greg doesn't envy and can you do the same thing? Or at least can we be striving to love in this way? And as believers, we, we really have to be very careful that we don't drift into a definition of love or a concept of love that is based on worldly standards. Um, really more of what I would call the definition that focuses on uh, feelings. Um, when we study love in Scripture, when we experience God's love and begin to at least um, live into it and, and understand it even in our limited human capacity um, we, we come to the realization that love is a highly highly complex phenomenon um, it's at the the heart of the very DNA of God himself after all God is love first John 4 8 uh, world, worldly love is often, uh, I'm going to make up a word here, but worldly love is often surfacy. Um, it, it has a tendency to last only as long uh, as those in the relationship feel good about the relationship. Uh, but godly love is very, very different. In the context of a, a worldly concept of love, our, our moods you know, can be altered uh, by the number of friends on Facebook um, or how many people like something that we've posted versus God's love, which, which rejoices in the quality of deep, meaningful friendships with people who are genuinely interested in helping us find hope and live with purpose. And it's not to say that our friends on Facebook aren't interested in that. But if I'm, um, if I'm defining my worth based on the reactions I'm getting from something that I'm posting somewhere, um, I don't know how long that is sustainable. Understanding my worth as a child of God seems to me to have much more uh, substance and staying power. Because godly love... Well, that's, that's a laying down your life type of love. Um, that's the type of love that Jesus offers freely and equips us then to share with others. And I, I think it's the type of love uh, everyone is looking for. Um, but there's so much noise out there, internal noise and external noise, um, for a lot of people to recognize that love when they see it. And here's the beautiful thing. It's, it's our job as believers to show it to them. And so a question before us today is, how do we effectively show God's love to others? Well, I think if we are effectively going to share God's love with others, that we have to make a shift to intentional discipleship. Um, perhaps we could even say, based on our conversation this morning, intentional, relational discipleship. And this contrasts in a lot of ways with educational discipleship, which was very effective for many years. Um, but, but the world that we are in today processes uh, information much, much differently. The world thinks differently than it did when educational discipleship was really the norm in most all churches. So as a result, um, we need to, to be as creative as we can be in how we intentionally pursue relationship opportunities with those who don't yet know Jesus. 
Uh, Patrick and Harrington uh, share a wonderful table that highlights some of the differences between educational discipleship and intentional relational discipleship. And I want us to take a look at this, uh, at this table during our time together today. And I want to let you know that as I went through this list, I, I had a lot of light bulbs that went off in my head. I see generational differences here. Uh, I see generational values represented here. And here's the thing. These are not good or bad. Um, they're just points of reference. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is just explore and hopefully provide a few insights as we progress. And so educational discipleship requires attention to Scripture. Intentional relational discipleship um, really is more about a personal relationship pointed to Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean, and when we read through these contrasts, that we're, we're going to, you know, we, we kick one out at the expense of the other. I really think what we're looking at here is a both-and dynamic versus an either-or dynamic, and so it's really important to keep that in mind. Educational discipleship really focuses on Scripture and the Holy Spirit. Uh, intentional relational discipleship focuses on Scripture, the Spirit, and relationships. Um, the educational uh, framework typically revolves around our head, what's in our mind, uh, filling, our, filling our, our brains with information. The intentional relational model is more about head, heart, and hands. It's more of a holistic uh, framework for being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, educational is typically more academic in nature. Uh, intentional relational uh, has a tendency to weave in teaching, modeling, and coaching. Um, in the educational framework, there is a heavy emphasis on factual knowledge. In intentional relational discipleship, it's more of an emphasis on life application. Now, again, let me reinforce here, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are wonderful qualities and characteristics in both. But I think as we look at this list, it helps us understand um, what previous generations valued and what worked really well for previous generations in the context in which those generations were seated. The context has changed. As a matter of fact, many of us don't even recognize the context that we live in anymore. And so we need a new set of tools uh, to work in this new uncharted territory. And some of the things that uh, Patrick and Harrington point out, I think, work very well in this new context. Uh, to continue, educational uh, has typically a focus on information, uh, content, um, there is no breaking of bread in the, in the meal sense. Of course, we share communion weekly, but not in the really sit down and have a conversation uh, over uh, table time. Uh, start, uh, stop time typically is you know, very important, uh, quick. I can't begin to tell you how much criticism I've taken over the years for the sermon being too long or the service going over. Um, in an intentional relational model, those things really vary. You know, they, they don't really matter all that much because it's about taking time to form relationships and really uh, focus on the quality of the relationship versus the quantity of time saved or time lost. Um, in the educational model, a teacher typically is looked to as the expert or the preacher is looked to as the expert and is expected to have all the answers. But in the intentional relational model, it's really more of a, hey, we're all in this together. Let's figure all this out together. And you may be thinking to yourself, you know, this is beginning to help me understand uh, some of the new language that I hear. Language like transformation and language like supportive relationships. And, and uh, you know, those are kind of new on the landscape. But, but I'm, starting to, I'm starting to figure it out now that there is a purposefulness to this intentional relationship model that we are trying to bridge gaps with people that are biblical and that are based on truth. Um, it's just a, a little bit of a different set of tools for a different context. Uh, the last part of the list, the differentiation between educational and intentional, uh, the authors note that educational typically takes place, or at least it can take place in a large group. Uh, the intentional model typically takes place in small groups. Um, building and campus is uh, very important in the educational model. Home is more important in the intentional model. 
the lesson or the sermon is typically the agenda, and the intentional model doing life together is typically the agenda. And uh, in the educational model, a setting uh, traditionally is formal, and in the intentional relationship uh, model, the setting is typically casual. Now, I, I personally really appreciate the authors, um, their humility when they wrote these lists. And on page 78, they actually have uh, a few thoughts uh, after, they, after they list this table. They say, we understand that in contrasting these two approaches, we are drawing out the extremes, but we think it's important to point out these contrasts because the educational model has been so dominant for so long. In our experience, it requires an intentional and dedicated effort to push toward a more relational discipleship approach. It requires some creativity as well, so you'll want to explore ideas for how to make this work in your own context. Now, this is really fascinating to me, and um, I want to just you know, think out loud with you for just a little bit. I think sometimes we look at our values or we look at our frameworks and we think that is gospel. Um, and if we don't do it this way or that way, we are sinning. We're doing it wrong. I think we have to have enough humility to understand that the Bible is truth. The truth in Scripture is non-negotiable. However, the way that that truth is communicated, the way that we try to connect the truth of God with others, uh, is, has been, and always will be fluid in nature. Paul acted very differently with the Greeks than he did with the Jews. And he acted very differently with the Jews than he did some new Gentile believers. And he acted very differently with some mature Gentile believers than he did with those who were trying to leave Judaism and, and, and make their, their first you know, few years into Christianity. But he never compromised the gospel. And so I think it's important for us to consider the same thing. The country that we live in right now is radically different than the country that existed even 40 years ago. And so the tools in our toolbox need to be modified in order for us to reach people effectively. And we may sometimes hear or say or think things like, well, I don't like that change. I don't think we should be doing that. What if we tap the brakes just a little bit and asked, I wonder if this change might potentially reach a few more people for Jesus? And if the answer is yes, don't you think God would be more disappointed in us if we didn't try to be creative, if we didn't try to be innovative? I think if we could all just take a deep breath and we could understand that when Paul, for example, in 1 Corinthians 9 says, I became all things to all people so that I could win some to Christ, that there is a highly innovative and a highly creative spirit uh, at work as Paul is leading the Holy, uh, as the Holy Spirit is leading Paul to write those words. So let's not be afraid of trying to live intentionally, relationally, as we are about sharing the good news of Jesus with those in our circles of influence. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You know, Jesus was very intentional about his relationship with us because the last promise is the promise of his presence. He also, I think, clued us in here to something that um, it's not explicit in this text, but it certainly is implied. And, and that is, cultivating relationships is going to take time. You know, we don't just go into the world and boom, all of a sudden everybody wants to become like Christ. Uh, it takes time to show them the legitimacy of the impact of the power of Christ Jesus in our heads and in our hearts. 
how we think, how we act, how we treat other people. The list goes on and on. And so let's not be, um, let's not grow weary in well-doing uh, when it comes to creating relationships with others. Uh, but there's also an intentionality about that. I can withdraw and I can um, treat the church like a fort, you know, where we're going to close our gates and, and not let anybody else in. Or, you know, I can, I can treat the uh, church um, like a mission outpost that we are, we are going, we are purposefully trying to reach into our community and uh, share the good news of Jesus with others around us. Uh, I think also as we look at what we've, what we've uh, shared up to this point, that it's really important to remember that discipleship is absolutely fueled by love. It is the fuel of discipleship fire, and it's never coerced. Um, over the past few decades, there have been some churches that have really pushed discipleship to an extreme. I would say going so far as to make it an idol. And there's been some abuse and some uh, pathological controls. And that's not remotely what Jesus had in mind. Um, I cannot imagine trying to be in a marriage where there is someone who is trying to always control and and make you act or behave a certain way based on their understanding of how you are supposed to live well, it certainly wouldn't be a healthy marriage um, and it's certainly not a healthy way to um, be about discipleship so as our good brother paul says all things in moderation right i think it's also important to note that the bulk of jesus's time on earth was invested in a very small group of people did you ever think about that I mean, Jesus was constantly surrounded by large crowds, but he spent most of his time with 11 or 12 or so individuals. And so I think there may be a message there for us. Um, while I want to have lots of friendships and bless lots of people, I can probably only have deep, meaningful relationships with a handful of individuals at one time. However, if a church of a thousand people has deep and meaningful relationships with people in the church, but also people outside the church, well, all of a sudden we're not just a thousand person church, we're a thousand person church influencing potentially thousands of others. And so I think we really need to keep that in mind that, um, you know, as we, as we think about the discipleship journey, let's not spread ourselves too thin. Uh, let's try to really focus in on some key individuals that God leads our way uh, or individuals that God leads us to to, uh, to join us on this discipleship journey. A key, a key word in this part of our discussion is the word intentional. I really appreciate this quote by Richard Foster who writes, To become a disciple of Jesus requires intentionality, a purposeful attempt to foster the discipleship process day in and day out. Can you imagine if just 10% of our church um, started being intentional about the five-step process uh, for forming discipleship groups? Just think about it. If, if only 10% of our church was praying and listening to God, um, who are you leading me to, Father? Lord, please lead me to somebody. Please lead somebody to me. Um, can you think if 10% of our church were recruiting people to join in a series of discipleship uh, meeting times where there's prayer and study and confession and openness and honesty? What if 10% of our church was preparing? What materials are we going to use? What book of the Bible are we going to read? What topics are we going to explore? What if people were actually inviting people and then once they got there, engaging them uh, in the discipleship process? And then what if 10% of our people were releasing those six or seven others in their groups to go out and do the same thing? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Robert Coleman writes, If we do not make the journey from theories and ideas to concrete situations, then the concrete situations will be lost under a smog of words. It's been wonderful for us to talk about discipleship, but church, Jesus didn't say um, sit around and talk about discipleship. He said, go into the world and do it. Make disciples. Uh, 
Um, and so it is my hope, and it is my prayer that we will make these lessons actionable as we think about the future of our church. Next session, we're going to talk a little bit more about intentionality and how weaving our story into these seven elements will provide growth opportunities, not only for uh, those within our circles of influence, but for us as individuals as well. I so want to thank you for being part of our time together today. And I, I hope and I pray that you will have the courage to be very intentional. Uh, I hope that you will process, uh, particularly as we talked about um, the educational model versus the more intentional relational model, I hope that you'll just do some processing there. And maybe, as I did, have a few aha moments. Oh, it's not right or wrong. It's not good or bad. Uh, it's just a different set of tools for a different time. And then see what doors God uh, can open for you as you wade into a uh, relationship space with those in your circles of influence. I'd like for us to close our time together today in prayer, and I'll look forward to being with you next week for our final session in this study. Father, we thank you so much for the power of relationships, those very special relationships that we share with family, um, different types of relationships, but still very meaningful that we share with closest friends. Help us, Father, to grow those relationship circles, particularly as we reach out to people who do not yet know Jesus. Father, above all relationships, we're thankful for the relationship that we share with you through your Son, Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us never take these things for granted, Lord. In your Son's name we pray.